the presence of bones, the promise of breath, and a prophecy to bring life. Over and again in this valley vision, Ezekiel sees this connection between the dry bones, the breath of God, and the prophecy Ezekiel is to speak. The prophet's given this vision of a mass grave. These are bodies that have long decomposed. The scavenger birds of the air and the insects of the ground have taken care of any organs or muscles or skin that have been there. The bones have no marrow in them anymore. They are very dry, just pieces of scattered people, one on another, indistinguishable who is who in the valley. It is a stark reminder of our mortality. I'm reminded of that famous scene in Shakespeare's Hamlet when, when Hamlet and his friend Horatio come upon a grave digger at night who has just recently unearthed a skull. The grave digger reveals to Hamlet that the skull belongs to Yorick. Yorick was the jester of the king's court, and Hamlet, being the prince of Denmark, had known Yorick as the jester to his father, the king. He says this to his friend. Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jests and excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now, how abhorred in my imagination it is, my gorge rises at it, and he takes the skull in his hand. Here hung those lips that I kiss I know not how oft. Where are your jibes now? your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar. Such is death. In death, all we are is over, and we are but bones. Hamlet goes on to pontificate. Dost thou think Alexander looked at this fashion in the earth? He's talking about Alexander the Great a king's jester, a great warrior and conqueror. At the end of their days, they're the same, nothing but bones. Hamlet then ponders how after we die and we're buried, our bones themselves turn to dust, to dirt, so that even the bones of Alexander the Great might have been taken up and used into a stopper for a beer bottle. The remains of the great Julius Caesar to plug a hole in the wall to stop the wind. Death is the great equalizer. We are all bone, the rich and the poor, the happy and the sorrowful, the wealthy, the mighty, the lowly. God shows Ezekiel this scene of ultimate death, the end, lifelessness, and decay, not even identifying features of individuals anymore. And God asks the prophet, mortal, can these bones live? Jesus rides into Jerusalem before an expectant crowd in excitement. It is not a royal procession, but it draws up on the royal tradition of Judah Drawing upon the prophet Zechariah, Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey. Zechariah had prophesied, Lo, your king comes to you riding on a donkey. People lay their coats before him, a sign of, of deference and loyalty. They wave palm branches in the air, a symbol of Israel's independence as they stood under the oppressive thumb of the Roman Empire. Those in the streets of Jerusalem know Ezekiel's vision. They may have returned from exile some 500 years before, but they still know what it means to look out on a valley of dry bones. Caesar is just the latest in the oppressive powers that dominate the nation. High taxes, brutal wars, strict punishment for crimes. Rome was the greatest military machine ever assembled and demanded obedience from her subjects. Hosanna, shout the people. Save us, is their cry. 
The bones still lay in the valley. Lives laid to waste, broken, destroyed and forgotten, overlooked and exploited by their own leaders in Judea, by the Roman overlords. Mortal, can these bones live? That's the question that God asks Ezekiel in the midst of exile. O oh Lord God, you know, he replies. Ezekiel's wise enough not to offer a sure response, for who knows the mind and ways of the Lord? And then there's this promise from God. It is a promise of breath. God's breath is going to enter these bones, and they will live, because it is God who gives life. It was God who took the dust of the earth, after all, and formed the body of the first human creature, but he lay there lifeless until God breathed into him the breath of life. When God's people were leaving slavery in Egypt and they came to the Red Sea, God caused a mighty east wind to blow the water aside so the people could cross on dry land from slavery into freedom. When those same former slaves were wandering in the wilderness and they were hungry, a wind went out from the Lord and it brought quails from the sea. The presence and power and spirit of God, the breath of God, the wind of God eventually moves the psalmist to cry out, where can I go from your spirit? Even in the presence of bones, when life is gone, evaporated, hopeless and dead, there is still a promise of breath. It's not what Ezekiel can do or even envision. It's not what the people can do by their might or their ingenuity or their faithfulness or their creativity or their hard work. The people are nothing but bones. But God? God can breathe life even into those who have no hope, no life, no future, no willpower, no strength to go on. God's promise of breath comes to those who've given up on life entirely, those without family or friends, those without work or, or any kind of security, those who grieve and those who are numb, who just can't feel anything anymore, neither joy nor sorrow. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. You, the bones, don't have to do anything. The spirit, the wind, and the breath of God simply enters you in your decay. The breath of God comes to us, and that breath brings unexpected and unpredictable life. Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the people cry out in the streets of Jerusalem. That is some strong language to identify Jesus as the son of David, meaning he's the inheritor of the Davidic covenant. He should sit on the throne. He comes in the name of the Lord. That means he's divinely appointed. The breath of God is embodied within him. We've known this since Jesus' baptism, when the heavens parted and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove and the voice said, this is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The promise of the breath of God has entered the holy city. The one who brings life has come to animate the dry bones. In the presence of the dry bones comes the promise of breath. And then God commands Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones. God will bring life to the dry bones. God will put them back together 
God will make them who they may, were made to be. But God is going to use a human agent to bear witness to that breath. Ezekiel must prophesy to the breath. And it's that prophecy that brings life. He speaks the power of God to the bones and they begin to reassemble. Sinews and flesh and skin wrap around them so that they are once more identifiable as distinct human creatures. But as yet, no life prophesy to the breath, God says. And so Ezekiel speaks the truth of the power of the breath of God and the lungs begin to fill with air and the chests rise and fall and eventually hands and arms, legs and feet begin to move and the bodies rise up once more. God's breath brings life. God's breath must be witnessed to and declared by those who trust and know God's breath. Someone has to speak the promise so that the breath of God can move through the bones. The people of Jerusalem see the valley of bones, tossed into graves by the oppressive power of the empire. They anticipate that Jesus is the breath of God among them, the promise of breath among them now. But this is where the hope of Ezekiel and the desire of the people in Jerusalem diverge. As the week progresses, we see that Jesus is not going to be the leader who rises up and overthrows the oppressive Roman dictators to establish a new Davidic monarch on the throne. He's not going to replace one form of oppressive power with another human king who will just grow corrupt like every other human king. There is a far greater and more sinister force at work in the world, those twin powers of sin and death. And as long as humankind decides to organize ourselves around the powers of sin and the coercive power of death, then we'll never know life and peace. That's the message Jesus comes to proclaim. We see then, the people have the breath of God among them in Jesus, but they cannot prophesy to the breath. They want the life that they know as life. They want the breath to breathe upon them on their terms to bring wholeness and goodness. We can change that pronoun out pretty easily, right? It doesn't have to be they and there. It can be us and we. We want God to speak into our lives on our terms, to bring wholeness our way, heal my sick, repair my relationship, help me get that job, that house, that acceptance letter, make me feel better, God, and quickly get me out of this sorrow and despair and, and follow the steps that I've laid out for you to follow, breath of God. The frustration that God's breath will not be controlled by us prevents our prophesying to it. Because we don't want the breath of God to flow freely. And so instead of prophesying to the breath, we prophesy against it, and the cries of Hosanna turn into shouts of crucify. We prophesy against the breath. We will lay eternally in the valley of bones if it's up to our own will whether or not to receive the breath of life. So while Ezekiel has the presence of bones, the promise of breath and the prophecy to bring life, we see in this holiest of weeks the breath of God extinguished and turned into the presence of bones hung on a cross and laid in a tomb and the world turns dark. Those who were called to prophesy to that breath, they flee in terror. And the lead disciple who said he would never give up on his Lord denies that he'd ever known the breath of God. Those who were called to prophesy to the breath run away and hide.
except. Except for some women who stand at a distance and watch as the breath of God becomes becoming the bones of death. They watch as the body is removed from the cross. They note the sight of the tomb. And a handful of them, on the first day of the week, following the rituals of funeral rites of their tradition, come to that tomb, that valley of dry bones, 500-year-old Ezekiel's. And they don't hear these words exactly, but it is an echo of Ezekiel's vision spoken at dawn on the first day of the week. Mortal, can these bones live? Prophesy, prophesy to the breath. Amen.